I'd like to invite our second uh, speaker, Pete Masters, who's the coordinator of the Missing Maps project for MSF. Hi. Uh, I'm just going to do a quick timeout. I thought Sylvie would explain OpenStreetMap, and she thought I would, so I'm going to. Um, OpenStreetMap is a bit like Google Maps crossed with Wikipedia, so it's an online searchable map database that is created by its users. So just so you know. Okay, so NGOs struggle with a lack of freely accessible mapping data, as we just heard from the question. If you looked at the Google map of Bangasu Sioux Prefecture in Central African Republic, you'd be forgiven for thinking that nobody lives there. But actually, thousands of people live there. If you are trying to respond to a cholera outbreak and you have base map data and patient data, you can make something like this, where you can visualize your cholera cases, where they're occurring, how dense they are. Without base map data, it looks more like this. So the aim of the Missing Maps project is to provide the base map data that makes spatial epidemiology, intelligent logistics, and al resource allocation decisions much better and more effective. So with this map, you can't do those things. But with this map, maybe you can. So what is it? It's an open collaboration. Don't tell anyone in MSF, but it's an open collaboration <laughs> of four organizations, uh, the American Red Cross, the British Red Cross, MSF, and HOT. HOT are the humanitarian open street map team, and their members are called Hotties. <laughs> HOT are essential to the Missing Maps project. So they've been mapping humanitarian crises in open street map for over five years. It was their data going into Garmin's on, for search and rescue teams in Haiti following the earthquake in 2010. A lot of the data that appeared on Sylvie's maps of Ebola and Haiyan was data that they would have collected or coordinated. And right now, many NGOs are responding in Nepal using map data created by HOT. So the other three NGOs in this project are essentially accelerators. We can use our volunteer base, our communications and fundraising power, and our field experience and perspective to scale the HOT project. So whereas HOT are great at mobilizing their community to map Nepal and Ebola, we want to make it so that HOT can respond in Car and South Sudan, places where you know, the crises are, are largely forgotten. So that's the kind of, that's the kind of aim of the, the, the teaming up. How do we do this? We choose an area of interest and we prep it for remote mapping. So remote mapping is essentially taking a geographical area and applying a grid. And then you invite people to come and take a square in that grid and using satellite or aerial imagery, trace what they can see. So it might be buildings, it might be roads, it might be rivers. Once they've marked that square in the grid complete, an experienced mapper from the same community comes and validates or invalidates the square. So the quality control is built into the same community. So you have your grid, and once the grid is complete, you have a map. It's available online. It's, you know, anyone can access it. But it's not quite finished for our purposes, because for us to be able to locate patients, we need to understand where they are. And without local data, we can't do that. So we then take these maps to the field, and using paper atlases and GPS units and smartphones, we collect and add the local data that makes geolocating people and patients possible. So the the road names, the landmarks, the administrative divisions. And once this stage is complete, then we have a useful and usable map. So, so far in the Missing Maps project, over 2,000 people have contributed edits to the map, over 4 million edits thus far. And in kind of more humane terms, this means we've mapped the homes of over 3.5 million people in some of the, you know, the worst places on Earth. And of those 3.5 million people, over 1.5 million people we've also collected field map data for. So this is all very nice, but some practical applications. So this is Bangladesh. This is an area called Harazibag in Hazaribag, sorry, in Dhaka. Um, this is one of the most toxic places on Earth. MSF conducted an occupational health survey based on data gathered by the Missing Maps Project into chemical use in tanneries. This data is informing operational decision making. And without the base mapping data that they based the survey upon, it would, the epidemiologist who actually conducted the survey said it would have been impossible to survey exhaustively, so every tannery. 
meaning that the data that came out of the other end of the report would have been incomplete. This is Chad. In the top left, you can see the town of Mosala, where MSF works. They generally don't have any activities across the river to the east, um, but there are plans to, to scale up operations. They didn't know what was there, so Missing Maps volunteers collaborated with project staff with, who had GPS units to map the area, and there's now a network of villages with distances between them and plans are being made. And the last one is in South Sudan. So MSF conducts rapid nutrition assessments responding to uh, information on the needs of displaced people. Before collaborating with Missing Maps, they'd fly in, in the helicopter, they'd sketch the area from the sky, and they'd land and they'd consult with local people on where the clusters of people were living, how far they could walk in the day or the two days that they had, um, and then they'd carry out the assessment. We were able to provide them ahead of time with a map so that they were landing with something already in their hands, not only something that gave them a sense of where things were, but also with a building count and therefore you know, a rough population estimate. So when they landed, they still consulted, but it cut out a lot of that process. And it also meant they could draw onto the map. So any extra data collected could be drawn straight onto here. And this actually, not, not something we planned, provided a nice feedback loop, because we've now had some of those maps back with sort of subdivisions of uh, villages drawn on them. And we can now add that to OpenStreetMap. And next time someone goes there and wants a map, that map will be of better quality. So that's just a few examples. It's not all been happy in the missing maps. There have definitely been problems and definitely been challenges. And so I just want to take you through a few of my favorites. Mapping slums from satellite imagery is very hard, perhaps impossible. We need to find a better way to map to the kind of detail we need for spatial epi epidemiology in slums. And we haven't done that yet. The missing maps is very popular with people who are previously not mappers. The, the demographic of map mappers that are turning up to mapathons has changed massively. What comes with that is a whole load of new people who don't have mapping skills. And so there's a possibility that the map data in OpenStreetMap could suffer. So we need to build up our training resources and uh, our sort of access points to the mapping to make sure that the quality of data they're producing is good enough for our purposes. It's very hard to create a local OpenStreetMap community in Central African Republic. People don't have electricity, let alone laptops, smartphones, GPS devices. How do we help people living there have some kind of ownership over that part of the map? We need more validators. With all these new mappers entering into the kind of missing maps, open street map, hot community, the validators are being worked harder and harder and harder. They're very, very quality. We just went to the hot summit, so the meeting of all the humanitarian open street map team people. And validation was right at the top. They're very, very concerned with the quality of the data inside the map. And so we need to move people from being beginners to mappers to validators so that we can keep, keep that process of quality control going. And lastly, and my favorite, uh, we need to think bigger. So it was great working with uh, MSF in South Sudan, but we literally chased them around South Sudan. Like decisions on which village they were going to changed on a daily and weekly basis. We'd start a task and we'd have mappers doing it and then it'd be like, no, we're going there now. So we'd start <laughs> another task. So why not, in the rainy season in South Sudan, map the whole of Unity State so that when the rains have stopped and MSF is again going to conduct assessments, they already have the base map data there. So to conclude, we think we're onto a good thing. It seems that the missing maps is a useful and we've sort of proved the use case for it. We're happy with the direction we're going in terms of the workflows and techniques we've developed for field mapping and remote mapping. And although there are challenges to scaling this so that we are mapping South Kivu instead of just the city of Baraka, we think those challenges are definitely surmountable. What this means is that if we can scale to that kind of, that kind of area, everybody working in South Kivu, whether they're NGO or not, benefits from having access to, to free mapping data. So if two take home messages for you. One is that our volunteers are superheroes. They are the people who are at the core of everything. They are doing the work. They are creating the data that people are using on the ground. 
And this community is thriving in a place where we're giving them the opportunity to contribute to NGOs operationally. So they're not just giving money, they're contributing operationally. And this is really important. They're flourishing within this, within this environment. The second thing is that base map data, what these guys make, is one of the keys to good GIS and spatial epidemiology. Like, a lot of the, the beautiful maps and resources that Sylvie showed you are almost impossible without already existing base map data. In lots of the places that MSF and other NGOs work, it doesn't exist. Missing maps can help make that exist. So that's kind of it. It's kind of the tip of the iceberg on many, many different things. So if you have any questions or want to get involved, please get in touch, blah, blah, blah. Thank you very much, Pete. That was a fascinating um, description of Missing Maps project, very inspiring project. Um, have we got any uh, technical questions, either from our online audience or from within the auditorium? Um, this uh, sort of simple question. I was wondering, you're using quite a lot of volunteers to do this mapping process. Are yeah. people themselves interested in sort of mapping themselves? I mean, do you, do you find if you go to places either for commercial reasons or other reasons that people would directly give information to be mapped? In, in field mapping, so yeah, local. Yeah, in field mapping. Definitely, depending, like, depending where we go. So in Central African Republic, we worked exclusively with MSF national staff. No one else had access to smartphones or Wi-Fi. But in Bangladesh, we worked with about 30 volunteers in Dhaka, and they've actually gone on to continue mapping. So about two months after we'd left Bangladesh, they decided to map all the polling stations in Dhaka for the city elections. So that was a very, a very local use case, taking the skills that they'd learned and, and enriching their local society with it. And they're now also working with the American Red Cross and another organization called Ground Truth to do more humanitarian stuff. So yeah, they've gone on to do more and more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pete. Uh, I think uh, that's great. Thank you.